<clears throat> Shalom Aleichem, my dear friends. Thank you all for joining. I'm here in the beautiful Hollywood, Florida, in the home of Moshe Freilich. Moshe, say hello. Hi, everyone. Okay, so this is, he's the one who has been hosting the Shir Baruch Hashem over the years. I just want to give him a shout out of Hakar Satov and to give a bracha to this new house that he just moved into how long ago, a year ago that it should be a place of bracha, a place of atzlacha, a place of kedusha, and a place of laughter. And uh, I come from Yishlai Merakadosh, and at the moment I have a, uh, what's called a, uh, I think it's called an air conditioning cold. So I just apologize if she's a little bit uh, mutsunam. I'm going to try and do my best. Thank God, the subject matter is so incredibly interesting. It's, uh, moshech. it's such an interesting topic that I think you'll be able to deal with the fact that I'm a little bit, um, how do you say Mitzanam in English? Have a cold. And it's more than having a cold. Like, what can I tell you? So the topic is called the purpose of death. Uh, this is a hugely important topic. Um, it's not just a Hashkafa topic. It's very much a personal topic because every single one of us deep down knows that there's going to be a moment when we have to deal with the sugya in real life. My Rebbe in, um, in Yeshiva's Itchi, Rebbe Mordechai Elephant, used to say that the world is filled with people that thought that they would live forever, that thought that they were indispensable. It's interesting because where my father is buried, it's just a few minutes away from where he is buried, in Mordechai Elephant. I always try and say a parak of Tehillim by him because he wasn't so good to children. And I remind myself of what he said. The world is filled with people that thought they were indispensable and thought that they would live forever. My, my other Rebbe, and he is still alive, Baruch Hashem, or Shmarial Meltzer, he used to say that there's a little club called the Club of People That Die, and I'm just not a member of that club. That's the way that the world acts. But Akash Baruch Hu wants us to remember there's a thing called a Yehu Hamisa, there's a thing called a day of a, a, a day of, of, of Cheshman and Nefesh. <clears throat> the Mishnah says that a person should always remember where he came from, where he's going to, and in front of who he has to give a din v'cheshman. What we want to do today is not be morbid, but just rather to analyze what Misa is from a Tera Hashkafic perspective on a little bit of a higher level than we did when we were kids. Unfortunately, most people think of death as the same morbid way that they thought about it when they were little children. They never had a chance to look at the Makiris, never had a chance to learn it at a high level. There's a Shemis Baruch, this is all about to change. Uh, I'm asking you if you can to, if you have a Gemara in front of you, we're going to learn a Gemara on the Nun Hei Amun Aleph in Mesech Shabbos. For those of you who are not part of the Chabura, so I just wanted to remind you the Achabura gets together every Thursday night, and we learn sugyas in Shabbos. Mostly we learn halacha sugyas. Today we're doing the hashkafa sugya. But the MS is that today, because I'm a little bit disorientated, I'm here in Miami. It's much easier for me to teach a hashkafa subject um, <clears throat> that is Moshech. I don't know if you notice this, but I have a couple of white hairs. I don't know if this is has a makar or not, but they say the purpose of white hairs is to remind you that your time is coming and to make the most of your time, to be efficient with the small amount of time that we have allotted in this world. But the goal, as I said today, is to not be <laughs> sad and morbid, morbid and say, Vailon de Misnan, woe to us that we are mortal, but rather to understand the Hashkafic dynamics. So let's begin at the beginning. This Gemara on Shabbos Nun Hayam and Aleph is made out of four steps. I'm breaking it down to four steps so it doesn't feel like it's overwhelming. The first step is a statement of Rav Ami. Remember the name Rav Ami, okay? Ama Rav Ami. Ein Misa B'lai Chait Ve'ein Yisurim B'lai Aven. If you feel you've heard this before, it's because you have. This is a very, very well-quoted statement of Rav Ami. Ein Misa B'lai Chait There's no death without sin. And there's no suffering without iniquity. So the Gemara goes on and brings Psukim to prove his point. 
Rav Ami is in Amira. Tesis asks the obvious question. Tesis says, Ein Misa Belei Chet, Ve'en Yisur Belei Aven. The word Chet is normally associated with what's called Shegeg, and the word Aven is normally associated with what's called Zodain. It doesn't make any sense. Surely, death is a much bigger punishment than suffering. So why is it that Ein Misa Belei Chet, there's no death, Without chait, chait normally means shaygeg, and ain yisurim bele aven. Yisurim, which is suffering, is associated with aven, which is mazed. So Tasis gives a, a, a very powerful answer, and I want to share with you a little bit of a deeper understanding on Tasis's answer in about half an hour. What Tasis says is the following answer. He says, and I quote, <coughs> he said, um, excuse me, I'm using the Marshal's, uh, the Marshal's understanding of Tesis. There are Yisurim that are worse than death. Kamal, and he brings down, we're just having a, um, um, an echo over here. He says there's certain times when Yisurim is actually worse than, um, than death itself. So Kamo, he gives the example of the Gemara's Pasuk that's brought down, the Yisurim of Nagaim. So Tesis is claiming, according to the Marsha, that suffering from leprosy is actually a punishment that is worse than death. Now, I don't know exactly what this means. I do know that it happens to be in last week in Eretz Yisrael, I went to two different Leviahs. I went to one Levaya and I went to one Shiva home. And there, a little bit, the echoes of what Tesis is saying came out. There was a, a, a Yid um, from Memphis, a Haley Galit Yid called Alan Cutner. He passed away. He's a very, very dear friend of mine. And we're very close to his families. He was not Zeicha to have use of his legs in his later years. At the Leviah that I went to, that which made us all cry was when one of his sons says, now Abba is, my father is now dancing. And everyone started crying. He's a person that could not move. And so there is a certain level that death has a nechama over Yisurim, about the tragedies of Yisurim. The other shiva that I went to was... <clears throat> My, my, my best friends, uh, Jose Frowine, his father, Mr. James Frowine, passed away, and he fought cancer for quite a while, bravely fought it. He wanted to live. And then he told his son at some point that, I, how much can I suffer anymore? At that point then, he basically lost the fight, the will to win, and he passed away soon after. The point being is, is that we can learn Tesis Lefi Pshutai, and I'm going to show you a deeper shot in a few moments, that there are people that prefer death than to go through daily suffering here in this world. And therefore, the Pasuk says that chait, which is shegeg, the punishment is death, but yisurim, which we're talking about yisurim, the big type yisurim, the yisurim of, that are unbearable, so that is something that is amazing, that's something much more serious. And Mitz Hashem, I'm asking you to hold on to this idea, as we develop the share, and we're going to see a deeper understanding of these tasters as well. All of this is part of step number one in the, in the Gemara. The Gemara goes on to say the following words. Um, the Gemara says, <coughs> excuse me, um, the, the, I just wanted to say, I'm, I'm sorry, I just wanted to say the following statement. I wanted to say that if we left the tasters the way it is, we have a little bit of a question that we can ask ourselves, because Tesis has what's called three steps, regular Yisurim, death, and then super Yisurim that is worse than death. The problem that I want to answer is that if you learn Tesis the way I just taught it to you, it doesn't really fit in with what you and I learned as children. Everyone knows the Mishnah at the end of Yuma, the Gemara at the end of Yuma. It's quoted before Yom Kippur. We talk about the different levels of punishment. 
And there I had the quote in front of me from the Gemara and Yuma, the Kafvav, Peivav, excuse me. He says, the Gemara is talking about Chil Hashem. Chil Hashem is the worst sin. And there he says, when it comes to Chil Hashem, Shuva is not enough. When it comes to Chil Hashem, Yom Kippur is not enough. When it comes to Chil Hashem, Yisurim is not enough. And the only thing that's left is for a person to have Misa, Misa Memorekes. Misa is the final, final thing that can solve this terrible crime of Chil Hashem. You read the Gemara. The Gemara says that Misa is always the most harshest of punishments. Now we're suddenly finding the thing called Yisurim, and the Yisurim in this context over here are the Yisurim that are unbearable, and we're suggesting, says the Marsha in Tesis, that these Yisurim were actually worse than death. We're going to see a different way of understanding this Tesis very, very soon. What's the next step in the Gemara? The Gemara says, Meisvei. The Gemara is about to ask of uh, an example of two people who died without sin. We just said every sin is the result of death. You don't die without <coughs> sin. Just by the way, uh, I just saw Sif Sechai, Reb Chaim Friedlander. He says, we don't die without sin. We don't have Yisurim without Aven. So he actually translates the words beautifully that you say in the Shemona Esrei, Vahale Rufur Shalem Lechol Makasei. The word Hale literally means give us an elevation. So Rufriedlander says that if we don't sin, then we don't get sick. In other words, if you base this on the simple meaning of what we're saying over here, that sickness and suffering is a result of sin. So Vahale Rufur Shalem Lechol Makasei. Give us an Aliyah. And then in that world, so we're not shy to the world of sickness. Uh, we're going to see a little bit more that uh, it's not so simple. The next Gemara asks a question. The Gemara asks an example of two famous people who never sinned, and they nevertheless were, they died. So this goes against what we just said in the name of Ramavi. Who are these two people? These two people are <coughs> Moshe Aaron. Here's the whole Gemara. Amru Malachi Ashar Sifni Akadish Baruchu, Rabbi Shalaylam, creator of the world. Mipnema Kanasta Misa Al Adam Arishon. Why did you give Misa death on Adam Arishon? Amulam Mitzvah Kalat Sivisi Vavalov. I gave him one simple mitzvah. We're not going to discuss why it's called a simple mitzvah, but that mitzvah is don't eat from the eight Hadas. And he transgressed it. So therefore, because he ate from the eight Sadas, he has to die. Amrulai, Valay Moshe Va'arain, Shikimu, Kal Hatera Kulai, Umesu. So here we have a contradiction. We see two people who never sinned. Who are those two people? Moshe Va'aram. And they never ever sinned. So the Gemara comes along. And says the following thing, Amalehem, Hashem says, you're right. Moshe and Aaron never sinned. Nevertheless, they still have to die. Why? He brings a pasuk in Keheles, Perektes, Mikra Echa, the Tzadik Varasha. Everyone at the end has to die. There's no difference between the Tzadik and the Rasha. Nevertheless, the Gemara seems to be assuming there's such a thing as the Tzadik dying without sin. And therefore, we have a contradiction to our previous Gemara that says that a Misa B'lai Oven, everyone dies, it must be they sin. Moshe and Aaron did not sin. That's the Gemara. Yes, there is another opinion, a Brisa of Rav Shimon ben Elaza that says Moshe and Aaron died because of their sins. It brings down the passage that we all know in Parshas Chukas, Yan lo Himantinbi, because you did not believe in me, whatever that means, therefore you have to die hard, Mountain B. If you would have done appropriately with the rock, a died like manchen um uh, you wouldn't have to die. So this Gemara seems to be saying once again, like Ravami. The bottom line is, is that if you stop now, we have two separate opinions. Rav Ami says we only die because of a sin. The owner of the Brisa of the Malachi Asharis and the narrative that they had with Hashem says, no, a person can die without a sin. A person can die without a sin. 
That's step two in the Gemara. There's going to be four steps. Step number three is the most famous part of the Gemara. I imagine that all of you listening at some point have heard this Gemara. It's kind of famous. The Gemara says, four people died because what's called Be'et Yeshul Nachosh. Arba Mesu, Be'et Nachosh, literally means because of the advice, that's what Rashi says, the advice of the snake. Ve'ilein, here are the big four. Binyamin, Ben Yaakov, Amram, Avi Moshe, Yishai, Avi David, the Kilov, Ben David. Six names. Number one is Binyamin. Number two is Amram, the father of Moshe. Number three is Yishai, the father of David. And rounding up the big four is Kilov, the son of David. The Gemara goes on and discusses um, how we know this, but the bottom is that the end of the Gemara, the Gemara gives a final summary. But the point is that you see four people who die without a sin. This goes against Rav Ami. So the Gemara concludes with the following words. He says, Ze this clearly cannot be the one that is the Bryce. I'm just looking at Moshe's kid who's smiling at me, extremely cute. Because this list, who's missing from this list? <coughs> Moshe and Aaron are missing, are missing from this list. If they are missing from this list, it's got to be a different Manda Amma. So who could it be? It has to be the other Manda Amma, Shimon Ben Elaza. Shimon ben Elazar, he hold that Moshe of Aaron did sin. And these four people, just mid dimension, did not sin. Shema Minah. We see from here that according to Shimon ben Elazar, who is the owner of this Brisa, he's a Tana, and he is coming now unopposed, and he's saying four people died and nothing to do with sin. Shema Minah. Yesh Misa Belonchet. People can die without sinning. Yeshi Sir Belay Oven. We're not going to talk about how we know Yeshi Sir Belay Oven. We just spoke about death. Doesn't matter. And therefore, the Sugya ends with a knockout blow for Ravami that the conclusion is that people can die without a sin. How do we know? Because four people died without hate. That is the end of the Gemara. So now the fun begins. The fun begins when I ask you, how do we pass with it? It's a funny question. How do you pass with about the reasons for death? Sorry about my nose. I really apologize about my bad cold. Comes along the Ramban. The Ramban says that we pass them. This is the Ramban, by the way, in Teres Adam, in Shara Gamal his famous, famous essays about what happens after we die, about punishment and reward. Do not read the Sefer unless you have a strong stomach. This is the famous Ramban about what happens at the end of days and what happens after we die. He brings down La Halacha. Agamar Paskins, Yesh, Misa, Below Chait. You can die without sinning. However, he concedes, he said, you can have Yisurim below Oven. This is very controversial, and I don't want to go into this now. You see people suffering in a, in a hospital. People are going through terrible, terrible things. According to the Ramban, Halacha Lamaisa, they did not do anything wrong to deserve the suffering. Opens up all kinds of questions, which we are not going to discuss today. But the bottom line is, the Ramban says, with death, which is our topic, people die for no reason. People die without having sinned. Says the Mi'iri. The Mi'iri says, I quote, La halacha, we pass them, ain misa oven. He says, no. If you die, you must have sinned. Well, hold on a second. Can the Ramban, can, can the Mi'iri go against the our Gemara? <laughs> our Gemara just says the Ravami is wrong. A Gemara just knocked out Ravami. So what does it mean when we say that the Meiri comes along and says, no, it's not how we paskan. We paskan ain't misa b'lechet like Ravami. So he explains. Ve'ein lanu. 
Lahavil, do not get nervous, says the Mary. The fact that we said in our Gemara that four people died because of the Nachash. Don't get nervous. He says, and I quote, I'm just going to put on my reading glasses. Um, he says, Shemashma, she Kansamisa, Besibas Hanachash, Vahuncha Beteva Habria. He says, don't think that you should get nervous. Kiilu, <laughs> the only reason why people die is because of what the Nachash did. He says, no. He says, and I quote, She Avoidesayam, Shil Elu, those four people that died without sin, they are small sins. They are sm small sins that you and I do not notice. Those sins don't count. They don't go on the on the on the. Uh, uh, they don't make it into a school kaf mazayim. How do you see kaf mazayim, Moshe? Into the. Uh, uh, too tired, okay? Kaf Mazai means the scales, okay? Doesn't make it into the scales. Now, I just wanted to summarize what just happened over here. The Me'iri comes along and says something controversial. We're going to see in a moment that not only is he not controversial, but he's actually the mainstream. Once you go into the Sifri Kabbalah, and once you go into the Sfar that you and I learn, you'll see that this Me'iri is easy to understand. But at first glance, He's being very controversial. This is what he's saying. He's saying that these four people, Yishai, Binyamin, Amram, Kila, they did sin. It's just that their sins don't register. They are under the radar of the eyes of flesh and blood. Now, Rishonim are allowed to be cryptic. It's what they do. Rishonim consistently, especially about really important ideas, they only tell us half the story. The job of the Achreinim <coughs> is for people like you and me They would like a proper understanding is to decodify what they're saying. I don't think that the Sefer I'm about to mention have ever seen the Me'iri, but it, for me and for you, it's a great thing to know there's a Rishon that says and explains what we're about to say now is that these four people who the Gemara says never sinned, they did sin. It's just that their sins are underneath, so to speak, the table. They are ones that don't register. So what exactly is going on over here? First of all, we're going to see in a moment that if I stop the shir right now, we'll come to the conclusion that there's a machlokus between the Ramban and the Me'iri as to whether or not a person can die without sin. The Ramban says, it, uh, yesh misa below chet, a person can die without sin, like the big four. And the Murray says, no, there are sins there. It's just not being mentioned. Can we somehow reconcile the two? Can we somehow, um, like my Rebbe or Moshe Shapiro, as Atzal would say, can we make the two opinions that are machlekes reach out and say Shalom Aleichem? So let's see. I want to introduce you to um, the last great Makubal. Who is the last great Makubal? The Lashem. Who said that? The Chazanish. The Chazanish said the Leshem was the last great Makubal. And he <laughs> has an essay, <coughs> excuse me, about do we die because of sin? About this topic that we're talking about. Where is this topic? The Leshem, if you ever open up the Leshem, it's very convoluted, very hard to find things. So what I'm going to tell you now it's not going to help you. Jewish Oilem Atoyu, Chedek Beis, Jewish Dalad, Anaf Yud, Simon Gimel. Now you know. The bottom line is, if the Leshem drops a bomb. He says something that is very, very eye-opening and at first glance, very, very controversial. Before I tell you what the Leshem says, just a little word of introduction. This is the point where the class is about to go crazy. So put on your safety belt because we're about to hit turbulence. Rabbi Sai, we are about to hit turbulence. I want to read to you a Rashi on Daf Kuf Mem Vav Amun Aleph. Rashi on Daf Kuf Mem Vav Amun Aleph. This is um, um, on the words that says, well, the quote, Kishabah Nachash 
al Chava, Hitl Bazuhuba. When the snake had relations with Chava, the snake placed in Chava Zuhaba. Zuhaba is translated by Art Scroll as a pollution. I'm going to call it snake gunk just because it's easier to refer to it as snake gunk. Says Rashi, Kishinasan la Eitza, Lechem and Aitz. Baaler, when the snake gave her the Eitza, right, the advice to eat from the Eitz, Baaler, the snake had relations with Chava. Dixiv brings down the Pasuk in Bereshis Parakimo, the Hanachash Hisiani, the Nachash gave me advice. Hisiani says, Rashi, Lasha Nisuin, he married me. It comes out, what Rashi is telling us is that the word Eitza, the advice of the snake, is really hiding in the Lasha Nikia, the clean language, that the snake had relations with Chava. Birkid Rabbi Lezer brings down that out of that mess came Kayan. Oh my gosh, I don't even start to think about the consequences of that statement. Because you and I come from Kain. Noah's wife was Nama. She was the great great granddaughter of Kain. But the point is that that comes all the way from the Nachosh. And the Nachosh having relations with Chava is what caused death in this world. Since the Lashem. Oi. He says something very controversial. When the snake gave advice, which means had relations with Chava, what happened next is that because of that, Chava and then Adam was susceptible to this mystical thing called Chitzaynim, which is a thing that causes you to sin. We were no longer fully in control of our Bechira, and we were now under the influence of this thing called Chitzaynim that would force us to sin. What does this mean? So he goes on and explains with the following words. Al yedei zeh, nichshalim ha-tzadikim gamkein be'ez mechshalim v'hu mehechrach. He says that therefore, you see with tzaddikim, that tzaddikim will sin. And the reason why they will sin is behechrach, because of the influence of the snake. Now, this is the Lashen speaking, but the Lashen always, always sources himself. He brings down a Zayar, and the Zayar is in Bereshis, the Zion brings down the following. Call Tzadik, chayta behechrach. Every single tzadik has to sin. Why? Because we have the snake inside of us. So what is going on over here? If I would, if I would just say what the Zohar says, the Zohar says that we, even the biggest tzadik, has to sin against our will, we would say that the Zayar and the Lashem are chilek with the Bavli. The Bavli says that a person can go a whole life without sinning, and he still dies. Those are the big four. But we say no, says the Zayar. We say that those four also sin. <clears throat> Why? Because they have to sin. Why do they have to sin? Because the snake had relations with Chava. So what is happening over here? So if you're hearing this for the first time, I'm very excited to teach this to you because this is not just a hashkafic game changer. It's a whole twist. It's a whole different way of looking at death. It is literally revolutionary. If you've never heard these ideas before, it changes absolutely everything as he shall see. Introduction. Sefer Derech Hashem in Perak Gimel says something 
crazy, crazy, crazy. It's those of you that have it, because Derek Hashem is a common safer. Today it's broken down into subsections. Her Friedlander called it subsection Tess. He speaks about what's called Tevas Hamisa, the benefits of death. <clears throat> and I quote, Vulei Tuchal Hanashama Lezachik HaGuf. You want to come back into Trias Mason. You want to live forever and ever and ever. The way to do it is for the neshama to be able to, so to speak, ignite the body and to fix it. What does it mean to fix the body with your neshama? A little bit, we do this on Mati Shabbos with our fingernails. You hold your fingernails against the light. You notice they shine. This is, in a sense, symbolic of one day your neshama is going to fix your whole body so everything will shine a little bit like Moshe Rabbeinu's face under the mask. Moshe Rabbeinu's face under the mask was his face, not his neshama. But his face had been mezuchach, it had been elevated, it had been brought to a higher level so his face would shine. <coughs> Any one of you that was zeichet to see Reb Chaim Knievsky or any of our gedolim, you'll understand what it means that a lifelong of Torah can allow your face to shine. A person who reaches a certain level, he can reach theoretically, his whole body will shine, but he can't, says the Ramchal. You know why? Because of the hate of having relations with the snake. He says, because the snake had relations with Chava. So, the Ramchal says the following thing. When a person dies, the only purpose of death, the only purpose of death is for the body to go into the ground and the ground should cleanse it from the Zuama of the Nachash. This prepares the guf so that afterwards it can re reunite with the Neshama and it can live in Tchias HaMesim forever and ever and ever. Again, it's important you understand this. When Hashem created us, He created us perfect. Our Neshama is infinite. It is, so to speak, Hashem's breath, an extension of the Abish to Himself. The lowly guf on its own, can be elevated by the neshama. And then you and I can become this elevated, so to speak, using the allegory of the rabbis, like a twig attached to the tree. The tree is infinite, but the twig is made out of the same stuff, which means your neshama has actualized your guf. So the guf is now an extension of the neshama. Then you can live forever. You can be connected to the tree. What is standing in the way? The Zuma Sanachash. What will get rid of the snake gunk? One thing and one thing only. You put it into the ground. I'm sorry for being mor morbid with you. When I was a little boy growing into England, they had this horrible, horrible song about death where we used to sing, the worms crawl in, the worms crawl out, in through your belly and out of your snout. They bring their friends and their friends too and make a horrible mess of you. And this song was sung to terrorize little British boys and girls, which makes our culture so beautifully twisted. But now I'm telling you a chiddush. We want those worms, meaning we want that body to be cleansed. We want that body to be, as we're going to see in a moment, planted inside the ground. So when it comes out cleansed, it can reattach to the neshama forever and ever and ever. It comes out, says the Ramchal, that Misa, death, is the greatest gift you could possibly have. Because death is the process, and it is the only process that allows the guf to be cleansed and reunited with the Shama in a way that it can live forever and ever. <clears throat> 
Now let's go back. I have one more quote over here. This is not the Ramchal in Der Hashem. This is the Ramchal in Das Tunais, Sifkat Nai Beis. V'zeh ha'inyan, ha-tzadikim shemesu be'etif shel nachosh. He says, the Das Tunais of the Ramchal, he says that the reason why tzadikim die who have never sinned is because they need to have the etya shenachash, the zuma, the pollution of the snake has to be removed. Now, summary is that the snake is the problem, not the sin of Adam and Eve. The chait is not the reason for death. The chait is not the reason for death. The reason for death is the fact that we now have Zuamas, Hanachosh, inside of us, it has to be removed. Let me say this once again slowly, but dramatically. The sin of Adam and Eve is not the reason for death. The reason for death is it is a physical necessity to plant the body inside the ground to remove the snake removal. If I could give you a stupid marshal, those of you who are married with kids, your little child goes and plays football in the muddy field, comes back, his or her shirt is covered with mud. So the chait, so to speak, is playing that game. The chait is playing that game. But putting that shirt inside a laundry mat with a cleansing power is not a punishment. That is how you clean the shirt. There's no other way of doing it. So in exactly the same way, the only way to clean the body is by passing it through Mother Earth, which we call Misa. <clears throat> with that introduction in mind, with that Yisaitistic understanding, we can now go and understand the Machlekes between the Zayhar and the Bavli. But before we do that, I want to show you something incredible. That what I just taught you in the name of the Ramchal, if you read carefully Rabbeinu Gershon, he says exactly the same thing, which is a big deal because Rabbeinu Gershon, Rabbeinu Gershon is an early Rishon. Where is this Rabbeinu Gershon? The Gemara I just read to you in Shabbos, Nun Hay, is repeated again in, in, in Baba Basra Daf Yudalad, I think it is. Baba Basra Yudzayin Abed Aleph. It's word for word. It's the same Gemara. But there we have the commentary of Rabbeinu Gershon. And he says the following words. He says on the words, Et Yeshel Nachash, Be'etza, Shiyatza, Lechava, V'loi Mipnei Cheta Adam. It's not connected to the sin. It's only the Eitza. The Eitza we now know is a code name for that relation. So it comes out, the death is not connected to sin. It's just one thing and one thing over, only. It's a snake gunk remover. It's how we remove this gunk. Now we can understand the hardest part of the share is going to become easy because what we need to figure out is what's the machlux in the Bavli and the, and the Zayar. The Zayar seems to be saying that sin for a tzarek is forced upon him and the Bavli seems to say, no, they died because of the snake gunk, but they never did any form of sin whatsoever. It's possible that they're not arguing at all, which is always what we like to say, if possible. It could be there's a slight machlekes, but the principle is not a machlekes. It's because <coughs> what we're talking about is what is our definitions. We said, again, the Gemara says, Ein Misa Belechet. The Bavli seems to be saying black and white that there has to be some kind of a sin. A feel of a shaking, okay, could be a sin with shaking. You serve, okay, we're, we're, we're going to skip out you serve for the moment. But the Gemara concludes that four people died without a sin. The big four. Now, comes along the Zayar and seems to be implying that everything is Behechrach, that the people, these four people who never sinned, yes, they did sin and they were forced to sin so that they could die. 
So what's going on over here? So if you remember, I quoted to you about half an hour ago, Amiri. Amiri says, is Kiviyochel, that every single tzaddik is tripped up with a chait that is happening under the radar. I want, based on the Lashem, to give a different explanation of what it means, a chait under the radar. And what I want to say to you is the following thing. I want to say that there's different types of sins. Actually, a little bit, I saw this written in our farm, but uh, but I want to I want to say a little bit in my language, the way I can explain it, the way I understand it best. The Torah has six hundred thirty commandments. There's uh, there's there's many many sub commandments that Chazal talk about. All of these things like eating non kosher food and keeping Shabbos are all things that we understand. Not saying lashon hara. All these halachas make a lot of sense. But there's a type of chait. I'm going to label it a chait elyon. A chait elyon means that there's something has happened that allows what's called the chait of Adam Lechava, which we're saying was not really a chait, but the mitzias of the nachash infecting the body with the zuhama. It allows the tzarek to have done something so that the person can experience death, meaning we're coming in with the following hanacha. Death is actually a good thing. Death allows the body to be cleansed. Death is something that is necessary because every single human being, including Yishai and Amram and Binyamin and Kilov, they have the effect of the snake inside of them. So we need death. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives us the ability to experience death so we can be cleansed. But what are you going to do if you're a tzaddik? You see how twisted this whole thing is? A tzaddik is a problem. He's not going to be cleansed. So Kodesh Baruch who gives him what's called a chet elyon. A chet on such a lofty level that we don't even know where to begin and talk about it. We mentioned earlier on Moshe and Aaron. So all of you remember from learning Chumash, where was Aaron's sin? Even Moshe Rabbeinu's sin was of the highest of the highest. But Aaron, he was, so to speak, passive. And yet, he had to die, and yet he wasn't allowed into Eretz Yisrael. Such a thing called a chet elyon. These chatarim, which are chet elyons, which are chatarim in machshava, the chatarim on a very, very lofty level, they are necessary so that the body can be put into the ground to experience death. Today, I learned, I prepared this shir partially in the Kailal in Miami. I came up with the Kiddush. Honestly, I still would like uh, feedback from uh, all my friends that are listening. Rabbi Ruben Fima, if you could tell me your thoughts, I'd appreciate it. Because all these things are, are, are ideas that are still rolling through my mind. I noticed something interesting. Binyamin, Amram, Yishai, Kilov. Each one of them has stories in Midrashim that connect them to the sin that is connected to what's called arayas. Arayas means inappropriate relationships. So, Binyamin, I can't go into this, but Binyamin, Pelegish Begiva, which is all about inappropriate relationships, was the tribe of Binyamin. So it has to have had some kind of a source in Binyamin himself. Amram. What did Amram do wrong? He married his aunt. Okay, so it's before Martin Terra. But you see, Akash Baruch Hu put into Amram's lifestyle without him sitting that he was connected to, on his level, a chait elyon. Yishai is my favorite. Because the Yishai story, those of you that know a little bit of Navi, is a little bit crazy because one of the most exciting narratives of David and Melech it's not even in the Chumash. It's not even in the mainstream Midrashim. It's found in a, in a Midrash called Yalkut HaMechiri. And it tells the story, the backstory, based on Tehillim Pei Tess. Tehillim Pei Tess is filled with descriptions of Dovna Melech suffering as a child. His father, Yishai, separated himself 
from his wife. According to the Medrash, her name was Nitzana. Is that an Israeli name, Nitzana? Nitzana. So Nitzana, she lost her husband because, so to speak, Amra went through a midlife crisis. Excuse me, Yisha went through a midlife crisis thinking that he should never have been allowed to call Yisrael because maybe it was wrong of Bayaz, his grandfather, to have married Rus the Moabite. So Rus married Boaz. Boaz died that night. Out of that came Oived. Oived was an Oived Hashem. Yisha was a Gavaltik of a so everything looks good. And then what happens? Then Yisha decides, maybe this is not good. Maybe it's better that I separate. Maybe it was wrong for my Zayda to marry a Moabite woman. And if so, it could be I'm not even Jewish. So he took his shifcha, and he made it tonight with his shifcha. If I'm Jewish, so then I'm a shachar you, and I can marry you as a second wife. But if I'm not Jewish, so I'm a shach, I can marry you. And he had some cheshbon, that he would have relations with his shifcha and bring out a new dog. And the shifcha went to the tzara and told him what the plan was, told her what the plan was, and between them, they recreated Rachel and Leah. So Yishai comes along. He thinks that he's going to bring a child from his shivka. Instead, he brings a child from his own wife. And that child is David. And the whole community looks at this child as some kind of a, I don't want to say, we're talking about David about, But the psukim over there, that to heal him, say what they were thinking. Until he was 28 years old, when finally Shaul Amelach outs him, so to speak, he lived a life of Busha and Cherpa. It all comes from Yishai having a machshava el Yoyda that ended up to contribute to what the rabbis called the Kupa Shal Shratzim, all the darkness that created the lineage of David Amelach. So just the bottom line, you have again, Binyamin, Amram, Yishai, what about Kilov? This is, a, this is an interesting chazal that I found. Who was Kilov? Kilov sounds like Kilu of. He looks like his father. So the Medrash in Parshas Toldis, the, the Medrash Tadchuma in Parshas Toldis, says just like Yitzchak had to look like Avravinu, because people said Yitzchak comes from Avi Melech. Similarly, when they looked at Kilov, they were making fun of Kilov and said, Kilov? The father's not David. The father is Novo. The mother, as you know, was Abigail. So Hashem made a miracle. The killer came out of redhead. And everyone realized, oh my gosh, he looks like his father. The point is that these four people, you see there's a chait that is very similar to the chait of the Nachash, associated with them, betam ha'alyon, on this highest level, to facilitate that these people should experience Misa to cleanse them from the hate of Adam and Chava. So the bottom line is that death turns out to be a tremendous chesed from the Eibishter. HaKadosh Baruch Hu allows ourselves to be cleansed of the Nachash. But there has to be a Siba to get us into the, so to speak, the ground. So death HaKadosh Baruch Hu facilitates this Tam El Yen Chait, and therefore the Bavli and the, and the Zoya are not arguing at all. Because the Bavli is talking about regular sins. These people never sin. You can't catch them on a sin. Like the Miri said, to our naked eye of Boston, you can't catch them on a sin. The sins they made were Dvar and Gavayim that we can only look at from afar. We don't really understand. Now we come full circle. Is that what we learned from this topic is something so important because next time you go to a Leviah, and I wish that it should be a long, long time such a thing happens, but it's part of the cycle of lives. You'll see that we have this crazy custom of putting a stone on the kever. I heard a story um, that uh, this is actually connected to Rev Ganak Shlita. That when Bill Clinton came for the Shleishim of, of Yitzhak Rabin. And they went to Har Herzl. 
And all the Israeli politicians put wreaths of flowers on his kever. So Bill Clinton took out of his pocket a little stone from the White House lawn. And he says, according to Jewish tradition, we do not put flowers because flowers are beautiful today, but they're gone tomorrow. But the Evan, which he placed with your left hand, Evan, look at the word Evan, Av, Ben, continuity. It's just a process. And three times a day, you and I say, Melech, Mamis. He puts to death. Is that a bad thing? No. Melech, Mamis, or Machaya. It's a process to bring real life. How? Umatzmiach, Yeshua. It's like planting a seed in the ground. The snake gunk is removed by Mother Earth. And now the neshama can come back in and it can explode with its true beauty. So let me just summarize, especially since the Heiliger of Eli Loeb has just joined us, summarize the important things that we've learned today. I'm not telling you to stop saying Baruch Dayan Emes when you go to Leviah. The pain is absolute. What we see to the naked eyes, like the Meiri said, we see sometimes he tzaddikim, we see them dying. We can't understand why it has to be so painful. But hashkafically, we understand that we're not putting a person inside the ground and getting rid of them. We're planting them inside of the ground so that the ground can cleanse the etiyah nachas, the advice of the nachash, which we now know means the zuama, the nachash pays in chavo. This is not a punishment. This process is not a punishment. Just like putting a, a dirty shirt in the laundry mat is not a punishment. It is necessary. It is crucial to cleanse it so it can be reunited with the Shama. We say, that's that moment that we're all waiting for, when we can finally no longer need this process. We no longer need that the Eti Shalacha should cause that even Sadiqim have to, on this high Gavoya level, be involved with some kind of a hate connected Arroyas. And finally, Be'ezra Hashem Yisbarach, we should be zeichet to a Trias Hamesim, the 13th of our Emikri Emunah, that will allow that hate of, excuse me, that no Chet Elyon will be removed forever, and that there will be no necessity for even the highest of the highest Chatoim, because the Neshama, will be able to go back into the cleanse guf and create this perfect, perfect symmetry, this symbiosis, like a twig attached to the infinite tree of the Eivishtar. And that is the schar of L'asad Lavo. We should be zeichet to enjoy it meher v'yameinu. Thank you for listening, and I wish you all a good Shabbos. Outstanding cheer, as usual, Rabbi. Outstanding cheer. Thank you, Ruben. Thank you so much. Appreciate it so much.